We've been taking some rather large steps in our discussion of the meaning of life during these past weeks. And I really do feel for those of you who have been following the conversation during the months because I realize that we have taken some massive steps in uh, philosophical and theological thinking. And I understand that uh, min much of it is new to you and much of it is kind of bewildering. And I really do hope that you don't think I've gone crazy on you all of a sudden. I haven't, but uh, it is uh, necessary at times when we're discussing such a complex question as the meaning of life, it is necessary to take large steps and to make large leaps. I really do hope that they haven't been too large in their logical uh, outcome or implications, but I do ask you to stick with me as well as you can because I will keep going back on the subject, and by all means, please do write to me if you wish, uh, to the address that I give at the end of the program, because I do want to try to explain what I mean clearly so that you have the best possible chance of getting meaning into your own life and beginning to get some satisfaction out of your life. You know that we've been discussing the central problem of human nature, that of our dual nature. That is, the battle between good and evil that goes on inside us. And the discovery of all of us that we have not only a good nature that seems to want to be kind and happy, but we also have a bad nature, an evil nature, that often seems to want to be unhappy and even to destroy itself, and certainly to destroy other people. And we've discussed at some length where those two natures came from and how both of them are actually as old as the race itself. The good nature is the one that has been given us by the person who made us, the creator of the world. And you remember we've talked at some length about why we believe there is a creator of this world. And he gave us a nature that was made to trust him and to depend on him. And that's what he wanted us to do. He wanted us to be his friends. And he wanted us to think of him as our dear father. And he wanted us to come to this earth and to do the job that he had made us to do. If you're a violinist, to play the violin. If you're a pianist, to play the piano. If you're an accountant, to count money. If you're a director, to direct businesses. He wanted us to do the job that he had given us to do in order to bring his world into complete order under his will. And in the process of that, he assured us that he would make sure we had all the money and the shelter and the clothing that we needed in this life, and that we would get great satisfaction from doing what he made us to do. And as a result of that, of course, we would have a great sense of our own identity and of who we were and of our self-worth and value. Now, we determined not to do that. We decided we'd live without him. We'd live independent of him. At least our forefathers did centuries ago. And so they developed, at the beginning of the human race, they developed another kind of nature, a nature that was made to live as if there was no God, uh, to live uh, as if we only had ourselves to look after and only had ourselves to look after ourselves. And so that nature began to develop all the neuroses that such a situation would almost impose upon us. Because we looked around, saw the four billion people in the world, not four billion at the beginning, I agree, but four billion now here in the 20th century, four billion others who were all trying to get the food, shelter, and clothing that they needed, who were all trying to get the sense of self-worth that they needed, who were all trying to get the happiness that they needed, and the only way, of course, we could ensure that we would get it, despite their attempts to get it for themselves, was to develop all kinds of competitiveness, all kinds of anger and jealousy and envy and pride, all kinds of ways of wanting our own way, of insisting on our own rights, of bidding the other guy down so that we could stay on top. And we developed a nature that is like that, a nature that is self-assertive, that is self-defensive, that is destructive of other people. And uh, unfortunately, that nature has become as real, indeed more real for many of us than our good nature. And the problem with it is that it is as old as the race itself. Now, what we have been saying is that the Creator foresaw all that. 
I hope you don't have problems with that when you consider that uh, Cray computers or IBM computers are able to foresee how much oil we'll need in the 21st century. They're able to foresee all the kinds of contingent decisions a certain person will make given a certain situation and a certain environmental background and a certain heredity. So if computers can do that, you know that the infinite mind of the creator of the universe can certainly do it. And that's what he did. He foresaw the kind of person you would become by your contingent decisions, and he knew that you would be hopelessly overwhelmed by that evil nature, that you wouldn't be able to do anything about it. And so what he did, and I know this is a tricky thing and a hard thing for you to believe, what he did was he remade you, remade you before he'd actually made you the first time. Don't get confused about that. You know that it's possible for a man like Einstein to conceive of all the possibilities of the theory of relativity simply in his own head. Many of his discoveries and his proofs have only been uh, proved out in actual astro astronomical experiments uh, years after he formed the theory. So even a bright human mind is able to conceive of all kinds of possibilities just in the mind itself. That's what the Creator did. Except that he was also able to remake you even before he'd made you the first time. He was able, in other words, to conceive of you, to uh, conceive of making you, conceive of what would be the problem in your life, and actually remake you before he made you the first time. So that, in fact, there are two natures available to you. There's the old selfish nature that you so often experience, and there's this good nature that is made fit to depend on God and not on the world. And so there is the possibility that you can receive that nature into your own life today. That's the only possibility. You'll never beat that old nature on your own, however many sensitivity groups you go to, however many books on controlling your temperament you go to, however much self-discipline and cold showers you use, you'll never control it. And you know that. Those of you who are addicted in drugs or alcohol alcoholics, or those of you who are even just addicted to bad temper or to envy or jealousy or pride, you know you've tried to control it and you can't. And the maker knew that. And he actually destroyed that old nature of yours. Now he destroyed it in his son. He had to put it into another human being. And that's why his son came to earth. He put it in his son and destroyed it there. Now, if you say, oh, how can that affect me today? What happened 20 centuries ago? Well, because there's no such thing as time, really. Time is just an invention, an accommodation that the Creator has made for you and me to be able to live in time-space world. But in timeless eternity, there is no time. And so he was able to put you into his son, Jesus, and destroy that old nature in him. And when Jesus actually cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was crying it out because he felt the wrath of his father burning out your selfish nature in him. And that's why he died. But that nature has been destroyed. And you may say, well, why is this old nature still alive in me? Because God allowed the ghost of it to continue in you today so that you would have a real choice to make in this life. You'd see one way to live dependent on the world of men and of things and of circumstances for all your security and your significance and your sense of value and happiness. And you could see the consequences of that life and this evil, selfish nature that it produced. And on the other hand, you could see the possibility of depending on God and trusting in him and the kind of nature that that would produce. You could see that in Jesus, his son. And so God wanted you to have a real choice. Now you can choose today. It is open to you. You can actually choose. The selfish nature that you have shadows and symptoms of in your present life, that nature has already been destroyed. It is no more existent. It is no longer existent. The Creator has actually destroyed it in cosmic eternity. But the new nature that he has given you when he raised his son from the dead, that nature is available to you. If you say to me, how do you receive it? By believing, that's it. Simply by believing that God has done what he has said he has done. There's a verse in the New Testament that might help you to grasp that. It's in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. And it goes, our old self was crucified with Christ. That's it. And all you have to do is believe that. Believe that. And then begin to listen to his spirit that he will put within you who will tell you, what to say to your wife at the crucial moment. 
what to say to your colleagues at the crucial moment. That spirit, if you obey it, will enable you to live in the new nature every day of your life. And that can begin today. Let's talk a little more about it tomorrow.